You would not believe how much we know about the universe, right? I was taught in school that the basic fundamental laws had been figured out, and that we understood how the universe was formed, how old it was, and what the heck was going on in those places we couldn't see. Pretty cool, huh? Science is cool with a capital K. Yeah, I know. Nobody in science knows what a cap is. I know. That's why we can't pronounce it Charon. It's Charon. It's a Greek word. And you guys are reading the Latin translations of a Greek word where there's a CH at the front because the Latins didn't have a kappa. This is why I don't like science because it doesn't make any sense. There's no internal doctrinal consistency. You guys don't even study your topic. You just buy into somebody's lectures and go on from there. All right, so let me talk about science for a minute. Let me talk about cultural sociology. Yeah, yeah, cultural anthropology too. This is very important because we have to wonder things. We're curious creatures. We have to wonder things like, well, where did you come from? Mommy, where did I come from? Well, see, dear, during the last ice age, a lot of the ocean was frozen, so there was a land bridge between Asia and the North American littoral. Huh? <laughs> I thought you were going to teach me about sex. No, uh-uh. So the point being, somehow, man, unless he evolved there independently, separate but equal, and that's highly unlikely, man reached Australia, the Austral continent, Australia, right, by outrigger canoe, yeah, Maoris or some other island dwelling people during time of war, time of hardship, time of island dwarfism making their women too small to enjoy a good time, whatever the problem, or island giantism. It's too funny when you talk to scientists, they say like, well, the reason those animals are so small is because it's island dwarfism. The reason those animals are so big is because it's island gigantism. Make up your mind, science. Okay, well, anyway. <clears throat> so they got to Australia some, somehow, all right? The first um, Aboriginal peoples, the first native Australians. Because anyone that was there before we got there is a native, believe me including the spiders and the snakes. So let's talk about that journey from some hypothetical island, a way stop along their massive migration from the Solomons or wherever, pushed by the currents of war or starvation or, you know, white people buying up all their property and then kicking them off white people buying their property from other white people, never asking them, and then taking them off. But other than that brutal history, let's talk about the less brutal history about paddling your canoe across the Great Barrier Reef into Australia. All right. If you have a, a large canoe, I've seen them. We all have seen them, right? In the Welcome to Hawaii, there's like eight people in an outrigger canoe, and they're surfing in off them. That's how they come in. Unless they've got women and children or old people on board. Or perishable goods. But anyway, you're coming into Australia across the Great Barrier Reef. So you're passing the major breeding grounds, the world's biggest breeding grounds, for one of its most curious apex predators, the great white shark. The cold point is down there. These sharks grow seven meters long. That's roughly 23 feet. Um, that's big enough to be considered a monster if it's coming at you. As a matter of fact, the Jaws shark is not substantially bigger than the largest great white sharks. That's sobering thought. Go watch the first Jaws movie. As bad as that animation is, the little, that little clip where it's swimming around the boat and you realize the boat isn't nearly as large as you thought it was is a good indicator of how big a great white shark could get. So your outrigger canoe has got, say, eight people on it. It's a fairly large thing as uh, boats go. Not very large for a ship, but certainly large enough to move you and your whole family 500 miles across the Pacific Ocean. Well, I'm going to ignore the meteorological implications because the Pacific Ocean is not always a friendly place, and when it's not, men die. 
But I'm going to talk about crossing the Great Barrier Reef, where there's a lot of bored great white sharks, some of which are close to, or perhaps even exceeding, seven meters pre collar length, in other words, without the tail. That's a big animal. Wow. Even, even as a fish, which is ostensibly cold-blooded, the great white sharks and the mackerel sharks in general, I think, have an adaptation that makes them, of almost all fish, warm-blooded. That's scary, isn't it? Stuff they didn't teach in school. So great white sharks have the abilities that we usually attribute to mammals. Uh, higher energy usage, um, greater burst speeds, uh, um, greater maintenance between uh, high energy expenditures. Hmm. Better brain activity, because the warmer your blood is up to a certain point, the more efficient your brain is. It's just a physical problem. And those sharks are curious. And do you know how they explore their, their uh, environment? By biting stuff, because sharks bite. They don't have hands. They can't. They can't. I mean, must be tough to be a teenage shark. But anyway, they explore things with a bite. Go watch television. I don't, but I used to. And you will see people in pontoon boats teasing, well, uh, interacting with great white sharks. And the great white sharks come up to you and they'll look at you. They, they spy hop. They come out of the water and they look at you. You're the queerest looking shark I ever saw, and they'll like go back in. And then they'll come up to your boat and they'll like go along it because they can sense the magnetic field from the metal in its structure. And then they'll get up to the pontoons and they'll give it an exploratory bite. I'm going to leave out the fact, the demonstrable fact, that there are animals that know what a pontoon is for and deliberately try to sink boats. Just want to let you know that happens. Researchers have reported it on numerous occasions. However, the great white shark may or may not be hungry. It is certainly curious. As I said, it's a very curious predator. It wants to know what's going on. So it's going to come up to your canoe and it's going to bite the outrigger. Well, that outrigger is not very powerful, very strong. It's just a piece of very light wood. And the uh, yeah, great white shark could crunch right through that sucker. Yeah, I didn't like that. But it's going to smell all the pee and the poo that goes overboard because sharks are best at one thing and one thing alone, detecting blood in the water. Yeah. And guess what there is? Guess what pee is? It's filtered blood. Lots of blood cells in pee. That's what gives it its color. And uh, poop has plenty of blood in it too. Don't go running off to your doctor. He already knows this. <clears throat> So, there are groups of sharks, today even, that follow the big pods of whales. It's easy to follow them. You just smell them in the water. You smell that blood. There are sharks that chomp through the poop because it tastes like blood. It gives them something that they don't think they're getting in their regular life. Whatever it is, yeah, I don't want any of my Cheerios. But anyway... <clears throat> So your aboriginal family has to make it across the most concentrated group of one of the world's apex predators, a very curious predator. So I don't know how many boats populated Australia. What does it take to have a breeding population? There are scientific studies about this stuff. I don't really believe in the science because they're making their models out of two nebulous uh, data set and so they really don't know what they're talking about. But it sounds good, and people continue to fund them, and that's all that matters in science is funding. Nothing else matters. Honest. So, say you made it past all those sharks. And because you're savvy, I mean, you're an islander, you know not to touch the pretty jellyfish or kick those pretty tiny little ringed octopi in the tidal pools. You know, you know enough not to do that. So let's not worry about that, but we will worry about getting across a belt of the most shark-infested water on the planet. And then, I mean, sharks that like to bite boats, and your boat's only made out of the lightest wood they got. 
Okay, so now we're going to go to the next part. Well, Australia, especially northern Australia, is estuarine country. Places where the ocean and the, and the water draining out kind of mix. Because the water draining out is kind of like not coming down at a steep angle, so there's no force to it. It's just kind of like drifting in off the marshes. And uh, that mixes with salt water, and you get an estuary. Uh, estuarine environments are quite different than ordinary environments, and they are the preferred abodes of two pernicious predators. One of which is one of the most documented human killers in all of history, and suspected of killing millions. The salty, the saltwater crocodile. Um, uh, what is it, Crocodilus porosus? So, these crocodiles are not friendly, and they, are, they were infesting the estuaries of Australia. So your people come cruising up, and they're not very used to crocodiles. They know sharks. They know white sharks. They know bull sharks. They know tiger sharks on the islands. I mean, so they're shark smart. But they're still peeing and pooping over the side, so sharks still pay attention. And then you get to the estuarine area, where the sharks and the crocodiles play, literally play. Bull sharks uh, and uh, certain other sharks have their uh, rookeries, have their breeding grounds in these estuarine environments. Uh, cypress swamps and whatnot. Uh, the um, salty saltwater crocodile, they're known to go thousands of miles in the water, can hold their breath long periods of time, and are generally left alone by most of their competitors for um, food resources. I'm guessing that killer whales don't respect that boundary because they don't respect sharks' boundaries either. As a matter of fact, there are whole families of killer whales. This is a beautiful story that I learned from marine biology. There are whole pods of killer whales who specialize in eating sharks. And you can tell they do because their teeth are all worn down to the gums. And sharks have, a, some sharks have a very rough skin. It's called chagrin when it's used as a material. It's covered with tiny little teeth, little sharp teeth called denticles. That's why some sharks, if you grab them, you'll cut your hands. And people don't talk about it much anymore, but when I was young, it was all very much the rage, is that sharks had tooth, teeth for skin. And not all sharks are that, you know, uh, serrated. Some sharks seem smooth to the touch. But in general, sharks have a covering of very tiny spikes in their mouth. You know, these denticles are sharp. So... <clears throat> You've got to get in past all these bull sharks, and then you have to get in past, and bull sharks are known for being very defensive in certain situations. I mean, Jonathan Baird's Blue World has shown that they can be fed by hand, and depending on where you are, and if there's plenty of visibility, that a bull shark is no different than any other shark. It's looking for something to eat, and if you are bigger than it, it's not going to try to eat you, probably. Okay. Now, sometimes they get mad. They'll arch their back and they'll come at you, you know, but in general, bull shark is just a shark. Thing is, in an estuary uh, or in an estuarine environment, visibility is very low, and that shark is probably very hungry or very aggravated. And uh, you're going to get attacked, or might get attacked, or brushed against, and then you're like, uh-oh, running for the shore on top of the water, first time in your life. You wonder if you're a holy man? Probably not. So... Now we've gotten our potential island family, eight people, right? I'm going to say four women and uh, four men, but, you know, divided in age. So some could be children, probably are, and others are adults, and maybe one of the men or women is very old and is the wise person in the tribe but, or in the family. But at any rate, you got to get past all these sharks, and then you, well, the storms, and then the sharks, and then the sharks again, and then the estuarine crocodiles, some of which grow over seven meters. Now, seven meter croc is half tail, so it doesn't seem as powerful somehow as a seven meter pre caudal length great white shark, and probably isn't. But it's big enough to eat a human being. It happens all the time. Crocodiles are the most proven predator of human beings. 
They've eaten more human beings than lions, tigers, bears. The only thing that has exceeded the crocodile for the number of humans killed is man himself. Anyway, so now you've somehow passed two belts of uh, carnivorous, sometimes aggressive and often curious sharks. And now you've gone through an area where the crocodiles are as big as your boat. I don't know if you watch films, but crocodiles are perfectly cool with attacking a boat if they feel like it. And several marine crocodiles acting, it's not in concert, but acting at the same time, because crocodiles will mass around a feeding event. It's plenty enough to take down any boat and eat all the people in it. So somehow, these people have to survive a miraculous passage to set forth on the promised land of Australia. And now Star Trek kicks in. Oh yes, you thought that a guy like me was a nerd. Oh baby, I'm bringing Star Trek in next. We're going to Eden. We left the island where the food was scarce and I don't know where the pygmy elephants were beating up our women or something, right? And we got all the way across all these dangers and all these deadly trials and tribulations and we set foot on this new virgin land of Australia. And uh, one of your people gets bit by a spider and dies right there in the spot. Two steps in, another one gets bit by an adder. Dies on the spot. Australia is home to... I'm going to just pull numbers down out of my head, so check them. But I think there are 279 species of venomous snake considered poisonous to man. And uh, out of those, 270 of them live in Australia. I don't know what the number of spider species is that's considered deadly to man, but of those, several of those species are endemic to Australia and live in places where you're going to encounter them. As a matter of fact, funnel uh, spiders, uh, the really bad ones, um, they're known to build their webs around human uh, habitations. They love corners. Yeah. So anyway, and then you're going to move inland a little bit. You've got, I assume, uh, Makuithal, you've got that big you know, wooden sword studded with pieces of uh, obsidian or whatever you've got. And you might have spears, right? Spears, they're always good in war. Javelin, you can throw a javelin. I'm not sure the Maoris had bows, I don't think so. But you certainly have some kind of a throwing device, an atlatl or a javelin or a spear. Slung stones, probably. But at any rate, you are now up against the most hostile environment for humans on the planet zoologically speaking. Because the north the northern littoral of Australia is not particularly cold, not particularly rainy, though it is pretty rainy. I mean it's rainy enough to grow crops and you know to live like comfortably if you're doing it right. But the uh, predators are these really fast, really smart dogs called dingoes. And dingoes are also aggressive and curious and being dogs they will chew anything to rub rubble especially if it smells or tastes like poo or pee or um, or has a really strong hair smell dogs love it don't they dog owners so those dingoes are going to come right for any human habitation they're going to prowl around at night looking for a baby looking for old people looking for toss-off stuff. And you know, human societies, we're throwaway societies. So there's going to be blood and guts and stuff that the people don't eat and pieces of the animal you didn't use even though you're a really wonderfully utilizational culture. Of course, you need to be. You have a few materials. You might as well use it all. But there's going to be awful. And that's going to be thrown outside the camp. And uh, dingoes are going to be trained. Around people, there's food. And they don't know better. So they're going to think, well, the babies are food. And they're alive, warm gush. So that's going to lead to what? Fifty thousand years of of heart heartache and twenty thousand years of heartache and uh, and terror, right? And today, dingoes are not domestic. That's the only species of dog I know of that doesn't domesticate in proximity to people. 
You biologists, you zoologists know a lot more about this than I do, so please correct me if you like. Uh, I'd be benefited to hear your comments on this. So you have dingoes prowling around your camp at night, and you have crocodiles, who are night creatures, prowling around your camp at night because they don't only hunt in the water. Crocodiles spend a good bit of their time on the land. And a seven meter in a lot of seven meter porosis is a pretty deadly animal in the dark. However, it's not going to spend much time out there alone because dingoes will mass up and attack a crocodile. Dingoes are tough. Okay, well, you've got crocodiles still endangering you, and you've got dingoes endangering you, but man has lived with wolves, you say, and so it's possible those eight people can survive and breed and, you know, raise more families and not become so inbred that uh, their babies all die. And, uh, or maybe you have an entire migration, and out of thousands, whew, wonder what the, ho what the home was like back there. Volcanoes erupting, maybe. But anyway, you need thousands, I think. You're not going to get a breeding population of eight people, Robins and Crusoe. Like they never showed you what happened to Robins and Crusoe, except they lived on the island and everything was the Professor and Marianne, and then they got rescued. Real shipwrecks are some terrifying stories. Go back and look for them online. You'll find some some stories that will curl your toes and your hair at the same time. And be careful not to bend your head over because then you'll catch your toes in your hair and you can't straighten up again. Now we've got, well, we've gone through weather, we've gone through the sea, we've gone through two belts of hungry sharks, curious hungry sharks. We've gone through a very wide belt and a, um, um, a post-tidal area, uh, the intercostal area, I think it's called, uh, where there are dunes, you know, it's like a desert behind the ocean bed. And then into the fairly fertile northern littoral of Australia. And you've got dingoes and you've got kangaroos hey there's an animal let's go talk to them let's go interact with these oh my gosh they're trying to kill us so not only are the predators mean in Australia but the animals you want to laugh at are mean in Australia too the kangaroos will just get a bee under their bonnet and 25 of them will come for you and beat you to death so no there's no being safe in the northern littoral of Australia. Everything's trying to kill you. Everything hates you. And if that wasn't bad enough, there are regular droughts. And droughts kill everybody. And there's no escape. Where are you going to go? Back out on the ocean? Oh, well, that's how you got here. And you got here because you really didn't want to leave your home, I'll bet. And you were forced to leave your home. Volcanism, war, starvation competition with pygmy elephants or, or, or maybe or maybe giant shrews island gigantism and uh, you packed up lock stock and uh, canoe and you came here to Australia and now everything hates you worse than it did on your island far worse than it did on your island and then if you bring any species with you like pigs or rabbits you don't know what's going to happen with an invasive species in a new zone you don't know what. Look at the Asian carp that are infesting all the waterways of the world because they come in eggs in the, in, the, uh, um, in the ballast water in ships and they just like dump in the harbors. The owners know about this stuff. They always do. The people that own the company where girls are going painting radium on watch dials, they knew radium was a deadly poison. But they didn't want to pay the girls more, so they just turned the other cheek. And those girls ended up with this thing called radium, uh, I think it's called radium jaw, like this. I mean, really, go look for the pictures. So owners know, they know the hazards. As a matter of fact, they're not dumb. They know the hazards and they're willingfully, willfully concealing them from the workers. They are, in a, in a word, evil. Uh, evil is self-willed pleasuring that harms others. And when you are pleasuring yourself by making a huge amount of money and not paying your girls much and not giving them hospitalization, and they're dying from horrible cancers that disfigure and, and ruin them. Well, yeah, that's evil. Not just evil, that's the worst kind of evil. Just saying. There are people in the world doing that today. Not with radium, or maybe with radium, but with other things that are equally poisonous. 
go to places like the uh, west coast of Africa and uh, um, some of the um, places around India and, and places in India where they uh, uh, demolish ships and the places are full of toxic chemicals and full of dangerous compounds and, and there are no safety controls. There are none. The nations are too poor. So anyway, getting back to my topic, there's no way that a single outrigger canoe full of hopeful immigrants was going to create the Australian Aborigine. No way. The land itself is too hostile. The wildlife itself is too hostile. Humans are not good against certain things. Poisonous snakes, or venomous snakes, I'm sorry, and venomous spiders. We're not good against those. As a matter of fact, we still have myths and, and legends and, you know, bedtime stories about stuff like that. So I think it's impossible the way that they're postulating that life moves from one continent to another, from one island to another. Absolutely impossible in Australia's case. There's no way it could happen, statistically speaking. I'm not a big user of statistics, but in this case, I think you can probably say, out of X number of invasions, none will come through. None will live 500 years. None will live 1,000 years. None will live 20,000 years to be discovered by those very friendly, we only have your best interests at heart. Here, read this book. It's called The Bible That Nobody Understands. And then we'll tell you why we're stealing your stuff. White people. Um, and so that's my story for today. There was no Australian invasion. There was no Australian DNA uh, invasion. There couldn't have been. The land is too hostile. The animals are too daunting and too terrible. It's difficult living in Australia today if you have a firearm and a truck. There are places in Australia that that's not enough. And this is after man has killed almost everything that's dangerous. Um, there's a story that, before I get off here, a story about crocodiles. Crocodiles are one means used by pseudoscientists to give credence to the idea of a racial memory. If you don't know about a racial memory, the idea is that there are certain tropes in human existence that carry on. Even if you didn't hear the stories yourself, you will think those thoughts. It's called a racial memory. The racial memories are about giants because there may have been real giants in the human experience somewhere. Uh, Gigantopithecus blackie. But anyway, talking about other animals, the, that animals might have a race memory. In other words, that all animals might know something because enough animals have died because of it. I don't believe in this, like I said, it's pseudoscience. But here's a way to show how this works. Between 1880 and 1935, Australians were running around happy as clams, drinking beer and shooting crocs, eating the meat, taking the hides, there was a brisk market, right, in crocodile or another. For many years, there still is now illegally. It's a big ticket item. So you can make a lot of money shooting crocs and skinning them, right, hanging the skins out. And that's me hanging on the shed all together now. So the crocodiles, the big marine crocodiles, the big salties I've been talking about, virtually disappeared. According to hunters at the time, back in the 30s, I read articles from the 30s about this, that after so many crocs in an area were killed, the other crocs would just disappear. You couldn't find one for love nor money or putting out a bait box. As if they had all got the message. This is something only humans can do, by the way, get the message. But racial memory says, oh no, a whole species can get the message. Man is dangerous. No. If that was the truth, then all the whales would have migrated away from shipping lanes. Instead, thousands are killed every year by ships. So no, that doesn't work. And whales are a lot smarter than crocodiles. But the appearances were 
the crocodiles got the picture that man was a deadly predator and hid away and kids weren't stolen anymore and women weren't killed at the at the well or at the waterfront anymore doing their laundry and Australia became a safe place with no more salties. Then they passed a law saying the salty is an endangered species and you're not allowed to shoot anymore. And doggone, if the salties didn't see the wabbit season, duck season signs being pulled down and come back into the area. This is the story from the hunters. The truth of the matter is too nebulous to define it with any accuracy, but I would guess that. They killed enough crocodiles, there weren't any. You know, if you're in a zone that's so deadly that all your adults die, well, then the, the children that grow up there die. And the adults or the children that, like, migrate off somewhere else might live. And so crocodiles were still breeding in the places where humans weren't. And when humans stopped shooting crocodiles, crocodiles coming into the area were no longer shot. Ta-da! Now crocodiles are coming back. Like any species. I just wanted to say that because these are narratives. We are passed along narratives that this must have happened, that that must have happened. And when you examine them, they seldom hold together. Washington and the cherry tree. These are called apocryphal stories. They're meant to teach you a lesson by lying to you. That's the worst kind of role modeling I ever heard. Okay, Wild Bill on the fact that Australia could not have been colonized by natives in outrigger canoes. And you're welcome.